So we're very happy to have Peju Du, who's visiting us from the University of Maryland. He's going to talk to us about hybrid C-cell epigenesis and TV singlets. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me, especially for this unusual seminar time. Thank you. And I enjoy the sunshine here. Uh, today I will talk about hybrid C-cell epigenesis and TV scale singlets. I'm Peju Du from the University of Maryland. This is a work based on a uh, work based on our advisor, Kaushu Bagashi, a student, Ajit. And Xi Shen Hong now is in Brazil, Sang Hong now in Kanao, and Luca Bechi at Brazil. Uh, we have finished one paper about the qualitative discussion of this framework, and we're working on a more quantitative one. Hopefully, hopefully it will come out soon. Okay, let's first, uh, first talk about our time, what we're going to talk about today. Basically, I will introduce several seesaw models, and then we will talk about nepton genesis in each of them. We first start with a simple formula, which simple setup is the standard type 1 seesaw and nepton genesis in it. Then we move on to another TV scale seesaw called inverse seesaw, and study nepton genesis in it. We will see that there are some potential problems or puzzles in inverse seesaw that motivate us to propose a hybrid seesaw and we study lepton genesis in that. It can solve the problems that inverse seesaw has. Uh, later we will talk about a more natural seesaw called warped composite seesaw, and hybrid seesaw can match to that model. Then I will conclude. Now let's first review what are the problems we are interested in. We know standard model is great. It enjoys a great success in its general test, but still there are some problems where it cannot be solved. For example, first is neutrino mass. In the standard model, neutrino is exactly massless, and, but we know from neutrino oscillation experiments, neutrino has tiny but non-zero mass. So you need some BSM physics to explain that. So that's the first problem. Uh, second one is the baryon antibaryon symmetry in the universe. We know that we are made of baryons and we measure the baryon symmetry in the universe. If we assume standard model and standard cosmology, that tend to predict too small baryon symmetry in the universe. We need some BSM physics to explain that. People also call that uh, making for some barrier genesis. Uh, of course, there are also dark matter and other problems. Uh, today, I will focus on the first two of them, and I will go to each of them to discuss what are the mechanisms to solve them. Okay. Let's start with the first one is the neutrino mass, and there is a famous and also well motivated model called type 1 seesaw. It is very simple. You just add one singlet formula to a standard model, covered Higgs and lepton doublet through this power coupling, and give a large myron mass to the singlet. Once you integrate out of the singlet, you get a Weinberg operator. Once Higgs gets a VEV, neutrinos, you get a neutrino mass. Formula goes like cover square Higgs VEV square over MN. So this is called seesaw mechanism because you can draw it as a seesaw here, uh, the heavier this end is, the MN is, the lighter standard model neutrino mass is. So this end goes down, this end goes up. So it's like a seesaw, the seesaw mechanism. Now let's put in the numbers we measure. For example, neutrino mass is 1.1 EV scale. And let's put the Yukawa coupling to be the natural size. The natural size, I mean, the third generation of standard model fermions is sort of natural, the Yukawa couplings which will range from 1 to 0 0.01. So if you, let's pick one of the value in this range, let's say 0 0.1. If you choose these two numbers, you can infer that the singular mass scale to get the right neutrino mass is 10 to 12 g. So the feature of this model is the power coupling is large, uh, large unsuppressed, and that kind of breaking is at some high scale. So that's a type 1 seesaw. OK. Let's move to another well, problem is the anti-barrier anti -barrier symmetry. There is also a mechanism can solve it. It is called lepton genesis. Instead of the usual barrier genesis, the idea is you first generate a symmetry in the lepton sector and then transfer to the barrier symmetry through standard model spectrum processes. Uh, in order to have a successful lepton genesis, you should have uh, satisfied some of three conditions. You need barrier at depth number violation, you need CNCP violation, and you need the interactions uh, to generate this asymmetry to be out of the equilibrium. 
that is the key ingredients of leptogenesis. Now let's ask ourselves, what is the model that we can write down to get successful leptogenesis? It turns out that the type 1 CSO, which is motivated for the neutrino mass, but turns out to also be a natural model for leptogenesis, because it has all these three ingredients. Uh, the lepton baron number validation is controlled by this MM parameter, it's a baron mass. The CNS, uh, CP validation is uh, done by the CP phase in the Yukawa couplings. Um, the out of equilibrium uh, interaction is when N, the signalet, decay out of equilibrium. That can achieve the successful leptogenesis. Now we will go into the details of how each step of leptogenesis works. So first step is you, uh, you should generate some CPU symmetry. Uh, there is a parameter we use for to control this uh, symmetries used, defined as Ipsilon parameter. It's basically the width of the singlet decay into Higgs and lepton doublet minus its CV conjugate, normalized to the total width. So that controls the net CPU asymmetry. In order to get a non-zero Ipsilon parameter, we need the interference of tree and loop diagrams. Uh, if you only work in a tree level, you'll get zero, so this will vanish. Uh, so now let's see what is the non-zero contribution to the Ipsilon parameter. It is the product of these two and take the imaginary part of it. We can see the parametrics that you have four power of Yukawa in the numerator, which we just product with, normalized to the width, which is two power of Yukawa. In the end, you get a two power of Yukawa normalized to some phase space. So that parametric goes like the width over its mass. In order to get this simple formula, we have an assumption here where the mass, simple mass, and Yukawa couplings are anarchic. If we, uh, in general, without this assumption, MN and Y are matrices. You need to do a carefully matrix uh, manipulation to get the right formula. But now, if you have, have this anarchic assumption, we can simply treat them as numbers, and we can just do some simple math of it. Uh, this is just for some parametric estimation. Now let's move on to the, another key ingredient is the time evolution of the CPU symmetry. In the early universe, we know it's uh, hot and we use temperature to track of time. So we define Z parameter, it's the mass over temperature to track the time. And we use yield, which is a num number that is known as total entropy, which can account for the dilution of the universe. So that basically only two of the key Boltzmann evolutions one is the change in number density in the signal N. The basic, uh, the dominant uh, property of this thing is that when the decay happens, it will lose number. When the inverse process of the decay happens, you gain number. So you have a relative minus sign here. If this goes to zero, if it equal to equilibrium uh, number density, it goes to zero. That means you stay in equilibrium. So that is how the uh, that is the first equation tells us. The second equation is how the lepton asymmetry is not just lepton number, lepton or anti-lepton, it's a lepton minus anti-lepton. So that is net lepton symmetry. So there's a generation part and the washout part. Generation is once one particle of N decays, there will be epsilon fraction of it goes into uh, net lepton asymmetry. So you have epsilon times this decay term. Uh, but other than that, there's also wash out. You will not get everything for free. There's also a left number violating process. You can wash it out. Now I will go into more, slightly more detail what is the decay process and what is the wash out process. Decay is basically just a standard decay diagram, normalized to Hubble. Wash out is slightly subtle because it is a delta L equal to 2 a scattering process. This is lepton Higgs going to Higgs star and lepton bar, so it divided in lepton number by two units. It's delta L equal to two scattering process. We separated these two into two regions, kinematic regions. One is if the intermediate particle can go on, on shell, we call that uh, inverse decay because you can backfill this out. The rate for this process is basically just the width. You only have two parts of the color in the, in the, in the rate. Uh, another part is the offshore part of it. So you need to account, you have two Yukawa in the amplitude and you square it in the rate. So you have a fourth part of Yukawa. 
So that's uh, we separate these two. In the nature of estimation, we always restrict R to the regime where inverse decay dominant in the offshore scattering. This can be naturally achieved because you see these different powers of Yukawa. If Yukawa is somewhat smaller than one, the first power of Yukawa should be smaller than the second power of Yukawa. So then we will, so later estimation will always stay in the regime where inverse decay will dominate in the washout process. Okay. So let's have a picture of what is the time evolution of the symmetry. And let's dig into a regime called the strongly washout regime. And this regime is good, as later I'll explain, that it is independent of this initial condition because n will be equilibrium. Uh, so we define a parameter which we call k parameter. It is the width over the Hubble scale at at m n t is equal to m n. If this is much greater than yeah. one, on the previous slide I thought you said you were going to be in the opposite. Uh, strong washout is defined as k greater than one. The previous one I was saying is the inverse decay greater than the offshore scattering. They are controlled by different parameters. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so in this regime, if k is greater than 1, that means at some temperature beyond or above single mass scale, you uh, single will be in equilibrium. Because decay and inverse process controlled by the width is in equilibrium. It's greater than Hubble. So at this temperature, equilibrium temperature of below, n will be in equilibrium. Not only n in equilibrium, the washout process is also in equilibrium because they are controlled by the same parametrics. It's also the width. So because of the strong washout, there's no net symmetry generated. Whatever you generate will be quickly washed out. The washout is in equilibrium. Our washout will be different once your temperature passes through the mass of Mn because that is the, you want to produce MN on shell. Now temperature is not high enough to produce the on shell. You only need to go to the Boltzmann tail to produce it. So that pick up a Boltzmann suppression, the washout process. So we define as there's a decoupling temperature where the washout decouples. And we can estimate the number density of the singlet at the decoupling temperature as the equilibrium number density over K. So that's the number density of the singlet at the decoupling temperature. Uh, after that, the washout go out of the equilibrium, so, but decay still happens. Decay will not pick up a Boltzmann suppression. So after that, whatever n decays, epsilon fraction of it will generate net asymmetry. So that's why in the end, the left hand symmetry over equilibrium number density is epsilon over k in the strong washout region. It's independent of the initial condition of the hand. The Boltzmann suppression applies to the inverse decay, but not necessary yes. for the scattering, right? Uh, scattering, we, now we focus on the region that the armshell dominates. Yeah, but uh, now you are competing some small Yukawa with the Boltzmann yeah. factor. So. That's right. So it's still possible that, that eventually it will be determined by the scattering. Yeah, there is a region where you need to worry about. Actually, later we'll say that is a bound that you cannot go into that region. So later I will show you. I will come back to that. That's a good point. Uh, now, so far we, we're only talking about left hand symmetry. We haven't talking about barrier hand symmetry yet. Then the barrier hand symmetry is generated uh, is basically using spiral process. You convert all the one fraction of left hand number to the barrier number. Now we can combine everything we have so far to get the final value of symmetry from this left hand genesis. It's the spiral process. This is normalization to the total entropy. It goes like 10 to minus 3 epsilon over k in the strong washout region. Uh, now we put back the formula for epsilon and k. We get a very simple formula in the end. The value of symmetry is other than this constant. It's only dependent on mn, the single mass scale. Now, we, if we put in the numbers we want, we know the observed value of symmetry is 10 to minus 10. The number we put in to get the right value of delta uh, y delta b is mn is 10 to, the 10, 10 to 11 g. 
So if you recall that the scissor scale we discussed before is around 10 to 12 GB. So it's roughly around the same order of magnitude. So that means a type 1 scissor is a model both can get uh, neutrino mass right and also successful left in terms. So it's good. Now, so, can I ask a question? yeah, sure. So your answer for why delta B is independent of the power that one. That's but because of the real assumption I mentioned before, we have an anarchic assumption. Right, so, but if I took y to zero, yeah, that, then would, that would not work. So when, how small does y, or how big does y have to be so that? Yeah, so it's it's first, this is in a uh, 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 strong washout region. In a weak washout region, is a different problem. So k is width over Hubble. So you have a two bond recover here. So if you how it cannot take to zero because k will go to zero. So if you stay in this region, this formula is valid. So how big is what does y have to be? So it also depends on the single mass, right? Because this is the temperature uh, mass a uh, temperature at the mass scale. I think if you tend to a twelve GeV over Planck, square over Planck ten to six GeV. So I think here it could be as large as yeah, I didn't check, but this is the case, it, it will not be too small. Yeah, because you can plug in 10 to 12 GB and the prime scale here. So as long as the width, the y square cannot complete that ratio. It is in the strong ratio region. Yeah, I didn't check the numbers. Yeah. Uh, now let's summarize the type, what can we learn from a type 1 scissor. It is a minimal solution to the neutrino mass and also a viable model for left hand genesis. Uh, but also people also uh, criticize about it because it's a single mass and a very high heavy scale, 10 to 12 GB. There's no hope to profit. And uh, another thing is, there's another theoretical puzzle is why there is an intermediate scale. The scissor scale 10 to 12 GB this is much, much smaller than the Planck scale. Uh, people also model it, maybe you can model it as uh, some left-right symmetry breaking at uh, 10 to 12 GB. But you need some extra ingredient other than the seesaw to explain why there is an intermediate scale. Okay, that's for summary for type one. Okay, now this, we know type one seesaw is good, but one criticism is that why uh, there's no signal because it's too heavy. Then the, uh, the Simple react to it, why not just bring down the signal to the TV scale where we can probe it, hope to produce it. Indeed, as people come up with a TV scale type 1 system. The, it basically is the same formula, but you just take the another primary range where MA is going to the TV scale. Uh, but there's a consequence of it. If you want to get neutrino mass right, the Yukawa company should be 10 to minus 5. So that is a small number. Then it's also hard to probe the how to produce these heavy singlets through these recover companies because it's 10 to minus 5. Uh, of course, people might model it embedding some uh, heavy W prime, Z prime can decay into the singlet, but you need extra ingredients to, pro to produce it. It cannot be produced through this recover company. Once you produce it, of course, there is a very, the people call it smoking gun or the golden channel for the type 1, uh, TV scale type 1 seesaw is the same sign that of consequence. Because that's a direct sign of the left number violation. You can see the same sign from the end decay, single decay. Okay, that's for the seesaw, type 1 seesaw. What about left hand genesis in this type 1 seesaw? Or TV scale type 1 seesaw? Uh, we know that for the formula we derived before, it's not specific to high scale. Uh, so it will be still satisfied this parametric estimation. If you put TV scale here, it is too small. So the naive way will not work, but people are clever enough to come up with additional mechanisms to get the right uh, left hand genesis. It's called resonant left hand genesis, pioneered by Pelopsis in this paper. So the idea is if you have some flavor symmetry or family symmetry to ensure that the singlet among each generation are degenerate at tree level, then you can have a resonant enhancement once you calculate the Ibsen parameter. So that can enhance 
the Ibsen parameter and hence enhance the let variance symmetry. Uh, but now you see we need some extra ingredients of the flavor symmetry to get the, the mechanism to work. Uh, but this is also a good way to approach it. I uh, just want to mention that. Okay, let's move on. Uh, at, so now we want to have signals. We want to put the signal at the TV scale. Are there any other CISO models can have a TV scale signal? Yeah, there is. We call inverse CISO, and the Lagrangian is different than the type 1 CISO. You add the signal to the couple to Higgs and lepton, so this you call a copy. You give a Dirac mass, even Majorana mass, to the singlet. Of course, you add a Dirac pattern to it. You give a small Majorana mass to the chirality, which does not couple to Higgs and lepton directly. Because of this small Majorana mass, if you go into the mass spaces, you diagonalize this Lagrangian, you get pseudo Dirac of the singlet. Because they are almost degenerate, but split by this small mu term. If you work out the neutrino mass formula in this setup, the neutrino mass goes like the power square, Higgs square square over m psi square times mu. It's proportional to this small uh, mass parameter. So in this setup, the smallest of standard neutrino mass is controlled by the smallest of this mu term. Now we can draw a picture here. Yeah, this is not the perfect picture, but I want to show how this mechanism works. It does, it's one arm goes up, is that if you make mu light, then you can make standard neutrino mass light. So that go in the same direction. Uh, now we're just checking the numbers. In this framework, the idea is you want signal to be at TeV and your color coupling to be large, so that we can probe through this color coupling. The consequence is the mu parameter should be very small. In this case, 1 kV, much smaller than the TeV scale. Now let's summarize. So the inverse CISO is a TV scale CISO with a separate coupling. We can have signals. And signal in this case is also different compared to the type 1 CISO, where in this case is a left number is almost conserved. It's only break by this small mu. So we cannot see that small mu in the colliders. You only see the uh, left number conserving signal, opposite sign direct signals. There's a puzzle here. Also the motivation we will promote to a uh, hybrid CISO is why this mu term is so small compared to TV scale. Uh, people might argue that mu is technically natural. If you set to zero, it will not generate it. Uh, but we still want to make it fully natural. To also, we want to explain why this is much smaller than TV scale. Let's move on to the lepton genesis in the inverse CISO. As we discussed before, we first discussed uh, should calculate the Ibsen parameter. Uh, in this case, because of the pseudo direct nature, these two signals are almost degenerate. We need to, the dominant diagram, loop diagram, is the self energy correction trait. As you can see here, these two signals are almost degenerate, so this propagator is almost on shell. So you get this resonant enhancement. Now, if you work out that if in the work uh, class basis, the mass difference is proportional to mu, and the Yukawa coupling has a phase, it's also proportional to mu. You can understand it by if you set in mu to zero, it purely goes to the Dirac limit, then this will go to zero, because uh, here will also go to zero. So that is why it's proportional to mu. The physical epsilon parameter in this case, we should consider the sum of epsilon one plus epsilon two. The idea is both of the two degenerate signal should be contributed to the uh, Boltzmann equation. But since their number density is almost the same, because the mass is almost the same, so we can we should sum over the epsilon in front of it. If we take the sum, the parametric dependence is the mu over n from the power copies, coming from here. And there is also mu over gamma from the propagator. So they're basically you are using some bright Wigner propagator and work regularly by width in the region where the mass difference is much smaller than the width. Okay, this one. Okay, now let's just take a closer look at this Ibsen parameter. We just uh, rewrite it in terms of neutrino mass and you call couplings. In the natural region of the inverse so as I showed you before, if you put it, you get the Ibsen parameter to be 10 to the minus 15. It's too small to get barrier symmetry. 
where we know the tantrum as 10. That's also the people here argue that uh, Levin genesis in inverse tensor does not work. Because of this one small mu parameter, you get a small epsilon. But now you can see this argument is not truly uh, robust because this is very sensitive to your cow coming to a sixth power. You can play with your cow coupling a bit by one order magnitude or more. You can easily get your tension minus seven. Then you might say, okay, in this case, does Nebula Genesis work? No, we, uh, our conclusion is no, because we haven't considered what shot. So that's the next step. We also need to consider what shot to draw the fully correct results for the left genesis in inverse system. Let's look at the one shot in the inverse system. It's still this delta L equal to two process. We we'll also take the unshell part of it. But now, now two particles can go unshell because they almost degenerate. We need to sum over these two contributions. And then you call copying are uh, off by a phase and leading order. So there's some cancellation among these two contributions. In the end, you will get the K effective parameter, which is a usual K parameter, the width over the bubble, times the mu over gamma squared. We can understand this parameter in the limit that if you take mu goes to zero, that means there's no left number violation, this washout part should go to zero. So this has a good limit. And the feature of this model is that this washout is smaller than the mu, to, uh, mu over gamma factor compared with the k factor. Okay. So we know have the ingredients of the epsilon and the washout. Now we combine everything together to get the barrier asymmetry in the inverse system. This is just the same formula that I plug in here. Then we plug in the formula in the strong washout regime that is epsilon over k. If we plug everything here, you reduce to the same formula that we have for the type 1 system. Although epsilon and k are different uh, from both sides, but in the end you get the same formula. Now if you put the TV scale here, it tends to get 10 to minus 18, it's much smaller than the observed one. Uh, we first did this uh, systematic estimation of the inverse seesaw, and we get this result as a kind of robust estimation. Uh, so, so yeah, the conclusion is too, uh, too small at TV scale. Now in my wondering, is this argument uh, truly robust, or is there some way to modify the decay channels of a singlet? Can that get the enhanced asymmetry? Uh, there is a theory behind it that suppresses the epsilon parameter. It is called the openness Weinberg theorem. The idea is you have the CPU asymmetry calculated in each model should be at least second order in the left number or value number violating parameters. So in our case, the left number violating parameter is this mu term. Uh, because in the, set, in the philosophy of these inverses, so you want the left number breaking parameter to be small. The same smallness of a left number breaking parameter suppresses the CP parameter. That is the uh, proportion to this left number breaking parameter squared. That's consistent with the uh, Lanovus number theorem. Uh, we can work out the same thing for the washout. It's also proportional to the left number violating parameter. In the end, this dependence cancels and reduce to the formula as we had before in the strong machine. Okay. So this is the only argument for the in the region, as you say, anarchic assumption that we just take Yukawa and mass to be just numbers. There is a way to modify that to go to some specific parameter space to enhance the uh, left uh, left hand symmetry. So that we are not claiming that left hand genesis at TV scale inverse is totally dead. There are some prime range, but maybe not that natural range. For example, if you have some degeneracy among generations, so previously you have degeneracy with each generation, it becomes through the drug. Now we add extra ingredients or extra assumption that if the singlet are degenerate among generations, then you can get enhanced, you can get this sort of degeneracy enhancement, which is m over delta m. Uh, compared to the real formula. So, so this we, uh, we just have a model that if we have uh, some flavor symmetry, if we have a zero, a sure is zero at the tree level, but we generally expect the Yukawa coupling will break it, break this flavor symmetry. So the natural size of this uh, mass bleeding 
will be the loop size and the color square. If you put in this back to this formula to get back to the right barrier symmetry, you need the power coupling to be 10 to minus 3 or smaller. Uh, so this, we view this number as also hard to probe at colliders because it's small and you need to have powers of the color to produce a singlet. It starts slightly go against the natural region of the inverse exon. So we consider it as a viable but sort of tight range to get the successful electrogenesis. Okay, let's quickly summarize what we have learned from inverse seesaw. That is a TV scale seesaw and could have interesting signals. But it is has some true problems where it is in tension with lepton genesis because of this uh, formula. And also there is a puzzle why mu is so small. So these two uh, puzzles or problems motivate us to UV complete inverse seesaw. Okay, so let's just re show this picture to show what is the main problem of the inverse seesaw and how motivate us to solve it. So there is a way, to, so the main problem is why mu is so small? If mu is small, we can get the neutrino match to be small because this end goes up, this end goes up. Then the question is what mechanism, what mechanism leave this up? We know that, as we discussed before, there is a mechanism to get small mass parameter in the theory, is a type 1 seesaw. So why not we can add the type 1 seesaw for this mu term? Indeed, that's what we did. We just add an extra type 1 seesaw to this mu term. We add a high scale module, which replaces this mu term, uh, this net mu term, by the singlet coupled to a new scalar and a heavy singlet and give it a large Majorana mass. So once you integrate out this heavy singlet, you get a Weinberg operator, or this CISO mechanism, type 1 CISO mechanism, for not standard neutrino mass, but for this mu parameter. Now we can view it as a picture here, that we have extra CISO compared to the standard type 1 CISO, and the heavy piece of the singlet mass gives a nice mu, and also gives the small neutrino mass. So that is a basic picture of our later I will summarize the hybrid system. So if you want to remember one slide or one picture that is capture the main idea of this talk, it will be this picture. Okay. So let's move on. Now we're just uh, summarizing more formally that we write the Lagrangian for Lagrangian for our hybrid system. It is basically the inverse system part of it. But you can see that we change the mass of a promoted trivial scalar and the power coupling. When the scalar gets a bear, the signal gets a mass. Uh, this part is the high scale module that can generate the mu term. It is the TV scale signal coupled to a new scalar and a heavy signal, which give a large mass. So the natural parameter range we're considering is the range where the power couplings are all largish than unsuppressed. We call it the natural region. And the webs of the scalar, we call, I put at TV scale so that we can probe it. Uh, the, singlet, the heavy singlet is much, much greater than TV. And the exact range of it, as we'll discuss later, it can, uh, can vary from a, a large range. I will show it later. So this is a UV Lagrangian. Once we integrate out of the heavy singlet N, and also the scalars get a web, we can reduce to a TV scale to the inverse seesaw formula, with just the mass be the bed, and also the mu term because, uh, because of this uh, seesaw formula. So that is why you can see the y mu is so small because of the MN and uh, seesaw give you small. Let's quickly summarize. The feature of this model is all the Yukawa couplings are natural and large, and there's no mu scales below electric scale. The small mu term that's the puzzle for the inverse seesaw is dynamically generated by high square seesaw. And neutrino mass is generated but mostly from the TV scale singlet. So that is the feature of the hybrid seesaw. Okay. So there is a question you might ask. What justifies this structure? Well, you can write it down, of course, if you want to solve the mu problem. But what's forbidden this end? Directly coupled to Higgs and Neptune. 
if you have a direct coupling of N to its electron, that will screw out all your mechanisms. So that is more like a type, high school type one system. Uh, the way to enforce this structure, we have uh, two approaches. One approach is you have some additional uh, U1 gate symmetries. You can have these N and the Psi charge under different new U1 gate symmetries. You can forbid the direct coupling of N to your Higgs and Epsilon. But today, I'm mostly talking about another approach to justify the structure is using the idea of a composite Higgs framework. So the idea is there are two sectors. One is the elementary sector, one is the composite sector. And Higgs is the composite, is the uh, hadrons or the pions of this composite sector after confinement. Uh, Higgs is a part of composite sector, and this singlet from Young's and singlet skaters are also part of this composite sector. Uh, the heavy singlet is external to the sector in the, in the elementary sector. We assume that the composite sector have a global left number symmetry. So in general, the strongly coupled sector could naturally have some external symmetries. Uh, but the elementary sector, we, we assume that left number is violated by the heavy singlet, uh, singlet mass. Because of this setup, N is elementary, Higgs is, Higgs is composite, there's no direct coupling of N to Higgs, Higgs and Epsilon. That is why we can forbid this type of coupling. Uh, the feature of this model is a left number violation is only done in the elementary sector by MN and then injected to the composite sector once you will integrate all of that. So that's a general idea to, set, uh, to enforce this structure. Now we can quickly get the neutrino mass in this setup. It, the formula you can simply work it out is the uh, usual type one system formula, but modified by this ratio of the scalar gaps. So that is a more freedom in the neutrino mass uh, compared to the standard type one system. Okay. Let's move on to the lepton genesis in this model. So previously we just discussed you solved the mu problem. Now what about the lepton genesis problem? Uh, the lepton genesis in this model features two scales. We first discussed there is a high scale module which contains only the heavy singlet and uh, the psi and the uh, uh, scalar phenomenon. If you only know talking about this high scale module, it's just like standard type one system. But we call it a psi genesis because you generate left uh, asymmetries in this psi, not directly in standard left -hand. So we call it the high scale psi genesis. In order to discuss what is the natural parameter range in this high scale module psi genesis, we first review what is the bound on the standard type one system. Then we know how can we extend it. In the standard type one seesaw, there are two bounds, which is the lower bound and upper bound of the singular mass we can go. Uh, the lower bound is usually called the Davis and Ibarra bound. The idea is that you want to require the epsilon parameter to be greater than 10 to minus 7. Because that's the minimum you, want, you have, must have, to get the 10 to minus 10 background symmetry. Because you have this 10 to minus 3 uh, entropy direction. So if you put this number, and you use a neutrino mass formula and this epsilon parameter, you can put it in to get the lower bound on MN to be 10 to 9 GB. So that is a lower bound. Uh, upper bound is what we, uh, the bound we mentioned before, we want the offshore scattering to be always smaller than Hubble, because if the offshore scattering is strong, it will get into a strong exponential washout. So whatever you generate, it will be quickly washed out. So that's the region uh, like as Jun Chai mentioned before, that we should always be in the region to be safe from the offshore scattering. Uh, so this is uh, serves as a constraint. The upper bound of MN, if you put in those formulas, you can get the bound to be less than 10 to 14 G. So that in, in these two uh, two masses forms the natural region for the standard type of system. Now we want just want to show that bound on a picture. To, more, to make a more intuitive picture of it. So we have a plot which the x-axis is the singular mass, ranging from 10 to 5 to 10 to 17 GeV. The y-axis is the Yukawa coupling. But in our case, we call it lambda. It's basically just a Yukawa coupling. Uh, on the plot, you can see this dashed line here. This dashed line is the 
epsilon prime is equal to 10 to minus 7. Above it, epsilon is greater than 10 to minus 7. So you should stay in the upper region above this dashing. There's another line is the line where the order of the width of the weight of the offshore scattering with an Hubble. If you are in this range, the offshore scattering is much better than Hubble, so we, you will not get a symmetry. So you will, we should stay away from that range. So we should stay in this uh, range for the successful left hand analysis. Now if you look at the standard type 1 seesaw, because of the neutrino mass formula, they have a relation of the power couplings and the singlet mass. So basically it just stays on the line on the plot. This line is the standard type 1 seesaw line. That has two intersections in this range. Is this intersection is basically the lower bound, and this intersection is the, high, uh, the upper bound. But now you can see in our case, we have a neutrino mass. It's a standard type 1, but modified by this ratio of the scalar waves. So if you can play with the scalar wave, you can scan the range of this larger uh, parameter range. You can go down to a 10 to the power 10 to 6 GeV and go up to 10 to the 16 GeV. So that is uh, why in our case, the hybrid seesaw can go beyond the standard range for a type 1 seesaw. OK. So far, we discussed the psi genesis as the scale around the signal mass. It's like some heavy scale. Then what happens about when the temperature cools down? Uh, let's separate it into uh, another scale. It's called intermediate scale, where the temperature is below the signal mass, but greater than TV. TV scale is where the, the scalars get away. Uh, in this intermediate range, you can integrate out of the heavy singlet. You get this kind of left number breaking uh, Weinberg operator, but for psi and the scalar. So in this range, there is a scattering of the psi through other particles like lepton and Higgs. So that will share. So this is not left number variety, but it will share this asymmetry from psi to standard wave lepton's. Uh, so the, there is a washout process. It's basically this contact interaction. But we know that this contact interaction is scales just like the offshore scattering. Because we, if it is offshore, we can just shrink it to a point. We, there are, we are in the region that the offshore scattering is smaller than Hubble at MM. Below that, this scattering has a T cube uh, scaling, and uh, Hubble has a T square scaling. So below that, the rate is always smaller than Hubble. So once we ensure that it is small at the single mass scale, it will be always small. So there's no additional washout effect in this intermediate range. So that means the symmetry you generate in the UV will be almost unchanged till the IR, or till the TV scale. So that is why we said the uh, symmetry is almost unchanged till the TV. Interesting things will happen at the TV scale. That because the scalar scalar web you reduce to the inverse seizure type formula, the Lagrangian. In this range, there could be a generation part of the from the decay of this new the TV scale singlet. But we know, we argued before, because the epsilon prime is small, this generation is too small, so we neglect them in the later analysis. Uh, another effect is, because psi has a mass, it will eventually decay into leptons. So all the asymmetry in the psi will eventually transfer or dump into standard more leptons. So psi served as a messenger, you carry this asymmetry first, and then uh, eventually dump into standard more leptons. Other than that, there is a new washout process at TV scale mediated by the onshore part of the delta L equal to 2 process. So psi and psi C could go onshore because at TV scale. Uh, this onshore, this washout is controlled by K effective parameter we discussed before as this scaling. So we can just combine the UV asymmetry and the TV scale washout, which is com comes at e to the minus K. Uh, the exponential factor here can be understood by the Boltzmann equation here. Uh, the, there is a source term, but we know it, because epsilon prime is so small, we can basically neglect it. So then we can see, you can solve this Boltzmann equation basically like e to the minus w, and w is this uh, k factor. So that is, can be understood why there is an exponential factor 
as a part of the K vector. Then after taking care of the standard spectrum process, we can get the total baryon symmetry in the end is the UV contribution times the uh, TV score shot. So that is the uh, main formula for the baryon symmetry in the hybrid system. Now let's take a close look at it. Because of this formula, we have an interplay of the high scale physics and TV scale physics. Uh, because the uh, uh, symmetry is done by the mostly done by the high scale symmetry, uh, high scale genesis, because of this formula. TV scale does not contribute to the, gen uh, the source term, but contribute to the dominant washout process here. If you, if you go into the region where the K effective is more than one, that means the TV scale effect is, uh, washout effect is weak. Whatever you've generated in the UV will be just uh, what you get in that. But there's another interesting region. If the K effective is big, that means you have some strong exponential washout in IR. Uh, in order to get the right size, you can uh, allow for too much asymmetry in the UV and you dilute it at IR to get the right size. That is a feature of in this hybrid system, which cannot be achieved in the type 1 system because you only have one scale. You cannot have play, interplay with the two scales to get one uh, to get to observe asymmetry. Now we look at the parameter space in our model. So we make a plot as the IR parameters x-axis to the single mass, the TV scale single mass, m psi, and y-axis is the color copying that psi coupled to left hand peaks. Uh, on this plot, we can have uh, two dash lines separating into four regions. This dash line is the border of the UV washout parameter k, smaller than one or bigger than one. Uh, and this dash line is the border of the IR washout factor is k effective if it's smaller than one or greater than one. So that's separated into four regions where the UV is weak washout or strong washout in UV or, or the same thing for that. Now these curved lines, these uh, color lines are different masses of signals. For different masses, you can scan different ranges of these four parameters, or four regions. Uh, what I want to draw your attention about this line is 10 to the 16 is a region where the standard type 1 system cannot achieve. And in our case, we can actually go into this uh, 10 to the 16 GB range. Also interesting in this range, that is this line, it is in the region where the IR washout is big, because it's below this, a K effective is big. That means you generate too much asymmetry in the UV, and you dilute it down to the right observed one in the IR, through this IR washout. Now we show you another plot, which is basically the same thing, but uh, here we fix the VEF of the scalar, and we fix the single mass, and vary the scalar VEF. We can get these uh, different curves. Uh, so the uh, take-home message is that this um, psi is order one in TV scale, and the color coupling is large-ish, so they are order one, uh, not too small. So that is where you can get uh, signals through this uh, we have a copy to produce this psi armature. Okay. So far, we're only talking about the primary space without constraints. So what about constraints in our model? So the constraints is a problem here. The dominant constraint from the flavor violating mu to e gamma process. It is a branch ratio of mu to e gamma. In the anarchic assumption, that in formula goes like you cover over m psi to the fourth power. If you plot it, it will be, I don't know if you guys can see it, is this uh, wedge is ruled out by mu to gamma. Yeah, so it's, sorry, the color is a bit dark, uh, it's a bit vague, it's this range. So it looks like very strong. But maybe that's what we expected, because if we, there's no specific flavor structure, even some TV scale physics with order one copies, and which value in flavor, so you might expect that would be ruled out. Uh, I mean, large range will be ruled out. But now we want to comment here that this bound can be significantly weaker if we impose some flavor structure. There is a one we discussed in the paper in that if you assume the Yukawa copy is diagonal in the flavor basis, and the single mass is also diagonal in the mass basis, 
uh, only diagonal contribution or flavor variety contribution is in the mu term. Since mu term is small in the inverse seesaw, so that also controls the flavor variation to be small. So in this model, the uh, left number violation and the flavor violation is controlled by the same mu parameter. So the flavor violation is also provided to the small neutrino mass. So that is why you can sig uh, significantly uh, weaker this part. So that is a comment in our paper. So now we can quickly summarize what are the features of the left hand genesis in the hyper so Basically, you have two scales. At the high scale, you generate a symmetry first in psi through so NDK. At the intermediate range, you have some scattering process. You can share this asymmetry uh, from psi to left hands. Uh, at TV scale, when psi gets a mass, it will decay into left hand, and it will dump all the asymmetry in left hands. And there's a new washout uh, effect where we should be take, take care of at TV scale. So that is a basic idea of the left hand genesis in hypersensor. You can understand that the psi as a messenger Actually, it's a messenger both for the left normal violation and also for the uh, asymmetry in left hand genesis. Okay, so now we will move on to another seesaw which we call it more natural seesaw. It's a, a com composite or warp seesaw. So the uh, hyper seesaw is also okay, but there's also a power, a uh, theoretical power for it because you introduce uh, several scalars. Scalars has its own hierarchy problems. So you are not fully solving the problem. You just add a, a new problem to solve some uh, problem you want to solve. Uh, but we consider the warp uh, component seesaw to be more natural. Now I want to introduce it. So the warp seesaw is first proposed in this paper. And I want to use we have some type 1 seesaw in the bulk, in the RS models, adding a large minority mass on the individual. Then we can do the usual closer kind of decomposition going to the 4D, we get the uh, first the zero mode and have a large minority mass and all these KK modes with Dirac mass and minority mass. If you work out the neutrino mass from this Lagrangian, you can see that this part of the KK contribution does not contribute to neutrino mass because of this Dirac mass uh, connection. Uh, so the only contribution to neutrino mass is through this module and that basically just like some type 1 system for that. And the uh, mass, in order to get the mass scale, in order to get the right neutrino mass, the temperature of the So the first uh, reaction to this picture is, it is also a type 1 system in the quality, so this in this KK basis. Uh, actually, I say no, because this is a KK basis, but it's not a mass aggregate basis. Because you can see that this uh, Majorana mass is much greater than the Dirac mass. So you need to diagonalize this matrix to get the right uh, mass basis. And that diagonalization is in general very hard because it's sort of infinite dimension. So we come up with a way to get the correct physical picture of it using switch to the composite sector, a composite picture of it, because we know the RS is a ADSFT duo to the composite Higgs. Uh, so this is the first proposal of people in our group that uh, you have a composite sector where Higgs is a composite of it, and the uh, singlet is in the elementary sector, but mixing with the composite sector through this linear mixing term. So at the UV, the Lagrangian is a composite sector plus a large uh, heavy singlet through this mixing. So this looks like just like type 1 system. But once you do the RG running, pass through the mass scale of the N, you integrate out of N, you generate a one more operator, or CISO formula for the composite operator of n squared. Uh, once you hit the IR scale, then you hit the confinement, you'll get an uh, inverse CISO formula. So this mu term in this, form, uh, in this framework, it goes like the, the TV square over the heavy MN, but still modify this uh, by this anomalous running factor. So this is the dimension of the scaling dimension of n minus 5. Basically, this is a net anomalous dimension of this composite, uh, composite operator. The idea is in the composite sector, you have this strongly coupled composite operator, you could have some large anomalous dimension. Because of this anomalous dimension, you can modify this running effect a lot. So you can have more freedom to get this mutual. So we are claiming that 
in the truly IR uh, mass basis, it turns like the inverse sensor like, for, uh, like mechanism. And we back it up, uh, in this paper, we back it up that in the 5D calculation, you can prove that it has the inverse sensor feature. And later we do some more phenomenological study of this model. Now we can see the hybrid sensor is motivated by the composite sensor. We can match from hybrid to the composite. So now we just put them side by side. The composite sensor is the formula before with this composite operator. Compared to the hybrid sensor, we can see that we can sort of match the composite operator to the uh, side and sphere. I just summarized here. So you cannot, you should not view it as exactly dual because this is a weakly coupled sphere and fermion. There's some strongly coupled operator. They are not exactly the same. But you can roughly view it as a first KK mode of this composite operator. Uh, after doing this match, then you can hit a TV scale, a composite sector will confine, or the hybrid sensor or the scalar data graph, you will uh, go back to the same inverse sensor formula. The new term in the composite sensor is goes like this, uh, which modified you by this anomalous running. But the new parameter in the hybrid sensor is modified by the scalar graphs. So I want you to draw attention to this matching because previously you can see that this ratio of the scalar graphs seems kind of weird. You just added by hand and there's no reason for that in the hybrid sensor. But this can be naturally matched to the component sensor by this anomaly running. That makes it a natural way to explain this seemingly unnatural ratio of the scalar graphs. And you can see here we don't need those scalars anymore. This is basically some running of the uh, of the computer. So now we can quickly summarize the features of composite system. The feature of the composite system is we have two sectors, a major sector and a composite sector. But the point we view this as a natural model is we only have one scale. We have a UV scale, and all the parameters in the UV are natural, are all the one size. There's no tuning in this sense. Uh, other scales, like CISO scale and the TV scale, are mostly dynamically generated. We don't need extra scalars to get this phase condition. So we can factorize out the, we can solve the uh, problems of the scalars in the hybrid system. So we view this more natural system. Uh, at the UV scale, it is a type 1 CISO, but it's become itself, uh, it becomes a TV scale inverse CISO after combining. There's interesting things we are now thinking about is how can we do network genesis directly in this composite sector? There is a subtlety here because at high temperature phase of this composite sector, it is deconfined. There's no heat, there's no resonances. So how can we describe the uh, lepton symmetry in that sector? Uh, so then we come up with maybe there is some way to use a framework of arm particle physics uh, proposed by George I. So maybe we can do some arm particle uh, lepton genesis. That's what we are thinking right now. Uh, we have some idea, but we haven't fully worked out. But it seems an interesting way, an approach, and we want to fully understand what's a lepton genesis in the component sector. Okay, now it's almost approaching the end, and I just quickly summarize all the CISOs we discussed today, and what are the features of them. Uh, the Haskell type 1 sensor is um, minimal and great because it can solve neutrino mass. Uh, the almost here means there are some, the, uh, it's, there's an intermediate scale we need to in, uh, introduce, so we call it almost. Uh, you can, it does not have signals because it's too heavy. You can have successful network genesis. TV scale type 1 does not really uh, solve the neutrino mass problem because you have a very small neutrino or recover couple. You need to address that small power problem. So you, you, you want to solve it in two mass, but you're adding a new, new problem to it. Uh, low energy signals, although they're scale, singlet at TV scale, but you cannot probe through the recover coupling. You can probe through another W prime, Z prime, but you need extra ingredient. So we call it maybe. That means you have extra ingredients to make it, uh, to get the signal. Left hand genesis also needs some extra uh, resonance enhancement, resonance in genesis to make it work. So also put the maybe here. For TV scale inverse sensor, we cannot naturally get neutrino mass because of a small neutron. 
uh, we can get signals through the larger power, but electron genesis does not work naturally. So we come uh, propose a hybrid system. We can almost solve the neutrino mass, but the module that there's some extra scalars, so we put it almost here because we want to reserve the yes to the for the obvious reason we uh, reserve it for the open component system. You can have uh, uh, signals. You can get uh, electron genesis right. For the composite system, you can solve the neutrino mass with only one scale, and you can get low energy uh, signals through after confinement because basically it's a TV scale inverse. Uh, we're working on this electron uh, genesis directly in the composite system. So hopefully, we can have a yes. Okay, I think that's the, uh, quickly go through the conclusion. Uh, we introduce uh, electron genesis. And in the inverse CSO, it does not work. It's too small. So it's uh, motivated to study the hybrid CSO, the hybrid of high scale and the TV scale, inverse. You can solve the real term and get successful electron genesis. It has large, uh, it enlarges the window of single mass beyond the 10 to 9 and 10 to 14 GV. And this CSO can be matched to a more natural CSO called the open component CSO. Thank you. Thank you. Same thing as scalars are similar. Very uh, hybrid, hybrid system. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so your scalars are. Yeah, also yes, all scalars and all new fermions are sim uh, similar gauge signals. So the advantage of the hybrid is just just we can get the broad hybrid space. Which is, which is uh, yeah, so motivation is we want to so address the puzzles in the inverse system. Where y mu is so small, and electron genesis does not work. Uh, but if you add in this, you do this one job, you add in this module, you can solve the mu term naturally, also get successful electron genesis. So that is why we are pro uh, proposing this hybrid system. So the only disadvantage is the hierarchy yeah, of the mu. Yeah, of the mu and the single mass. If there are no other questions, let's thank Deji again.